Good morning. As we come into our last uh, session of this particular study, welcome. Glad that everybody is here. Uh, thank you for being part of this. And I know coming in on this, heading into in Holy Week or on Holy Thursday today, we have several folks who are out traveling. So last night we, were, we didn't quite have the same number of folks and we don't have quite the same number of folks today. So we wish all those who are traveling and visiting well. We also have first Thursday lunch here at the church. I already heard someone talking about how good it smelled over there. So after this, you can go get lunch. Uh, do remember that the funeral service for Buzz Tanner is at 2 p.m. today. And then our Monday, Thursday service is at 7 p.m. tonight. Our Easter services, 7 a.m. sunrise, and then 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, and those services, by the way, both will be in the sanctuary, and they both are the same identical service uh, as we uh, celebrate Easter together. Lots of rain called for this weekend, so if uh, anyone who knows someone who's coming to the Easter extravaganza on Saturday, it has been moved indoors um, to, due to the weather, and most likely the sunrise service will be moved inside as well. It's supposed to be rainy and cold Easter morning. We will uh, almost certainly have that service here in the chapel, and Pastor Ben will be preaching that service. So, um, again, thank you for being a part of this conversation. It's, this has not been an easy conversation to have as we talk about things that are deeply personal uh, and, and that the church has struggled with and our particular denomination is struggling with about how to faithfully be in ministry and service to the world and how do we understand sexual ethics in a modern era. And that, um, as I said, that, that can be painful because what I found in my teaching of this and conversations with people in our church is that people have a variety of opinions. And some of those opinions are very, uh, very strong. And, it, and therefore, it does at times make it very difficult for us to hear each other. But we're trying our best to hear each other and love each other and do the Christ-like thing of maintaining love and respect for one another. So as we, today, I want to, as we wrap this up, I want to give us hopefully a little bit of a toolbox on how to think through this. And so what I am going to do is share with you all where I am. And I get that question quite often. And I want to show, and part of what I want to do is walk through how I think about the issue of sexual ethics in the church, and in particular, the uh, issue that's presenting itself in the United Methodist Church of uh, around our, will there be changes in the Book of Discipline, as we stated early on, the uh, and has been stated in town hall meetings, the current, uh, um, well, the current Book of Discipline, it it states very clearly that homosexuality is incompatible with the Christian lifestyle. And that um, while all people are people of sacred worth, that's one thing they want to acknowledge, all people are people of sacred worth. However, homosexuality is incompatible with the Christian lifestyle. And then it goes on to say essentially, therefore, we will not conduct same-sex unions in our churches or on our properties. And we will not ordain self-avowing, practicing homosexual persons. That is, um, those are the pieces of the Book of Discipline that often are, are at the heart of the debate around how we understand sexuality in the church. So, again, we're going to walk through how I think about this. Um, and then Roger's going to share with you all how he thinks about this. And I'm going to have the first half of the class, and then I will need to be stepping out to go tend to some things to make sure everything's ready for the 2 o'clock service for Buzz. And then Roger will be closing us out. So let's begin with a prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. And thank you for the opportunity to be in conversation with each other. Thank you for those who are online who are joining us and those who will be watching this later on after it is posted. We ask that you would help us to hold each other with a sense of love and a sense of care, 
uh, and that you would guide us in these things. For we desperately need your help in making sense of all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the things that uh, is often discussed in Methodist theology is this idea of what has become known as the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Um, It's a big, fancy uh, statement, but it, it basically what it represents is that within John Wesley's theology, and remember, John Wesley's a practical theologian, meaning he wasn't an academic theologian. He didn't spend his time in a university. He didn't spend his time, all his time in a library. He worked out his theology through his sermons and through his service to others and through organizing what became known as the Methodist revival and the Methodist movement. And so he is a a nose to the grindstone type theologian. He's a foxhole theologian because his comes from in the field. And that makes a difference if you're sitting in an ivory tower somewhere contemplating the, uh, the issues of the world. It's a little different than if you are deep down in the weeds living out life with people who are encountering Jesus in their everyday life. And so that's part of what drew me to the Methodist tradition was that kind of practical um, theological application. And, G- and Wesley is often known as a practical theologian. The, so within his work existed something he certainly brought from the Church of England was this understanding that the way that you think through issues of theology and just about anything else are around scripture, tradition, and reason. So those are embedded within the Anglican tradition, right, that Wesley was a part of it. The Bible, what does the Bible say? What what does the Bible tell me about this? Um, What does the tradition of the church tell me? And what does reason, how do I think about this? Uh, But within Wesley's way of doing things, it was identified that personal experience plays a big role. And so we get experience from Wesley. Um, And that, that is, how have I seen this play out in my own personal experience? Because one of the things that was happening to Wesley was when he was out leading revivals, uh, he experienced things that he wouldn't have experienced otherwise. I remember there's a story of um, Wesley being a close contemporary of George Whitfield. If you know anything about um, George Whitfield, led was one of the keys to leading uh, the Great Awakening in the United States. And George Whitfield, by the way, is a Calvinist, he's a Presbyterian. So they're kind of on different ends of the theological spectrum, but they were were contemporaries and they were friends. And and Whitfield told Wesley, he's like, you need to get out of the church and preach. And Wesley was like, what? You only preach in a church. You only preach in a pulpit. And Whitfield's like, no, you need to preach out in the fields. And, and, there, and in Wesley's writings, he talks about how ooh, he thought that was a vile thing to do and not proper to preach anywhere other than a consecrated space with a pulpit. And then he finally got around to doing it. And after he did it and experienced it, he writes, I have resolved to be more vile because of the results, because he saw conversion. He saw people come into Christ. He saw an impact that he never experienced in the sanctity of an Anglican uh, building. And so that's one way that experience shaped Wesley's understanding of how to go about work and theology and practical living and ministry. So scripture, tradition, experience, and reason are well identified within Methodist theology and Methodist terminology. You can ask uh, David who, as he's going through his, or, uh, through his uh, stuff uh, of being a pastor in the United Methodist Church. It gets talked about a lot in those uh, evaluations and in course of study and all those things. So, uh, so how do I, and this is me, I'm not telling you who you have to be, how do I understand the issue of human sexuality given the Wesleyan quadrilateral? Well, scripture We'll start there. Wesley always identified scripture as primary. In other words, if you're going to give heavier weight to any of these, scripture is the one that you lean into. Scripture uh, is first and foremost. It's the lens through which we see everything else. So 
that question then come, becomes, how do we understand what Scripture says about same-sex relationships? Let's just use that terminology. And what we have found as we've gone through these various texts is that while there are not very many texts that speak to this, when they do, and this is a, I'm borrowing this line from Richard Hayes in his uh, book on the uh, new t ethics in the New Testament, uh, Hayes says, Scripture doesn't say a lot about this, but when it does, it is unequivocally negative. Does that make sense? So that when Scripture does speak, Scripture says no in the places that speaks to this. All right? Um, we'll talk about a little bit more about Scripture when we get down to reason. But that's where Scripture is. And that has to be reckoned with. Um, tradition. What is the tradition of the church? This tradition is what have been the teaching of the church historically. Tradition often also refers to what is the teaching of the apostles? Um, and for instance, the Bible says very little about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that? You won't find a doctrine of the Trinity necessarily in Scripture. You'll find references to the Spirit. You'll find references to the Father. You'll certainly find references to the Son. You'll find Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. You'll find Jesus saying, I'm sending you another, an advocate. But there's nowhere in Scripture that says, believe in God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's how you do it. Here's what it means. It's not spelled out. Our understanding of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is from the teaching of the apostles. Paul certainly has it in his writings. He gives benedictions in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if, you've, if you are Christian then you understand God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the tradition is, is strong in that and, and how it understands Scripture. So the tradition of the church on human sexuality, as you probably are well aware of, the traditional teaching is that the same that is in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, that it is incompatible with, Christian, um, with the Christian lifestyle. That's the tradition. Now, one of the things we have to understand about tradition also is that sometimes we see tradition shift a little bit. For instance, um, traditionally, divorced people were often treated as second-class citizens in the church up until maybe 50 years ago or less. Um, there are still some traditions, some denominations, who will not allow a divorced person to be remarried in their church. There are, um, there are some denominations in our own community who will not allow a divorced person to serve in a leadership role because of how they traditionally understand scripture, because of what Jesus says about divorce. In the United Methodist Church, you can be, a, you can be an ordained person if you have been divorced. Uh, we officiate weddings of divorced persons in our church. We know no one desires for divorce to happen, but we also recognize. So that tradition has shifted, at least on that subject, to some degree, to a large degree in some places, to a small degree in others. Uh, for years, years and years, hundreds of years, uh, tradition was used to hold on to the idea that it was okay to be engaged in slavery to own other people. So tradition has to be taken with this understanding that tradition isn't something that's always set in stone and that tradition does morph and evolve at times. Uh, the tradition of the church for the first what, 1950 years or so, at least in our understanding, did not allow women to be ordained in to lead congregations. So again, Tradition is something that does have the ability to change and to be re-understood. Right, so scripture and tradition, though, on as a whole, would say that, that this is not compatible with the Christian lifestyle. That, that, and again, this is my, my interpretation. Experience. This is the one that I find where most people end up diverging. 
because your experience with homosexual persons or LGB, uh, LGBTQ people, it, 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 it can change how you think about this. Uh, as a pastor, over the last, I was uh, first appointed to a church in 1996. Uh, so every church I've served has had um, gay people in it, even the smallest of them, or uh, and people who are part of the larger community. Certainly, folks who have children who are who may be gay, uh, people who have family members who may be gay. There have been times when it's been a big issue in the churches that I've served, and there's been a time where it's been a non-issue in the churches I have served. What I have found is that as I have responded pastorally to people who are homosexual, it has changed my perspective. When you see someone as a human being, when you hear their story, when you sit with them, and you experience their, um, often the, the deep pain they have, it does impact how you approach this subject. Again, it's kind of like that difference back to Wesley of being in an ivory tower thinking about it versus being down in the foxhole dealing with it. Um, one person in particular comes to mind, uh, uh, a gentleman who's, um, whose name is Paul. And so... We were having some controversy in the church I was a part of because Paul and his partner were members of that church. And there was someone who was very upset that they uh, were there. There was someone who was very upset when um, Paul's partner wanted to sing in a musical group that helped lead worship. And that caused all kinds of issues in that particular church uh, because we had to deal with what is... What within the life of the church, what is, what, what are the standards, I guess, is the way to put it. But as I talked, I remember having a conversation with Paul in the midst of all of this. And he, he told me, he said, he, as a young boy, he began to understand that something was different about him. He said by the time he was eight or nine, he realized that something was different from his friends. Um, and then he soon became to realize that he wasn't attracted to girls. He was attracted to boys. Didn't want to be, but that's what he was beginning to come into as he entered into puberty. He was a member. His family went to a church of God. Uh, and the, the church of God pastor every Sunday, uh, he said it felt like every Sunday, uh, railed against homosexuality. Uh, railed against gay people, talked about how all, all gay people are going to hell and will burn in hell forever and ever and ever. And that the gay population only often became a punching bag for everything that was wrong in the world. And Paul asked me, and this is a very difficult question. He said, you know, I, as a, so what, here I was dealing with that, and I would go home, at, he said, I would, at night, every night I would pray until I fell asleep. God, please make me different. God, please let me act different. God, please let me feel different. And then he asked me, he said, what kind of God will not listen to the prayers of a child? Uh, and that's something, this, this was over 20 years ago that I, this story was conveyed to me. And it still sticks with me. And um, Paul's dignity, his honor, his who he is as a person, he and his partner, um, that it just, it, it just, you know, it impacted me. And as I've journeyed through life with people and dealt with pastoral issues around this, what I have found is that homosexual persons do not want to lead with their sexuality. They want to, they're simply people who they feel like happen to be oriented this way. That's part of the experience I bring to this. Um, if you have different experience of you, you may bring something different. And it can be, um, it, it can vary widely between what, it, what type of experience you may have of the gay community or of gay persons. So experience is one of those that is, uh, is tricky because it's deeply personal. Now let's talk about reason. Reason is what does... How do you put this together? How do you think this through? 
What does your brain say? Well, part of what my brain says is uh, there are the script that scripture does when it talks about this, it is negative towards same sex relationships. But my brain also tells me that this is not a meta narrative in scripture. In other words, this is what is scripture most concerned with? What's the Bible most concerned with? What I see in the Bible that the Bible is most concerned with is issues of justice, issues of loving God, loving each other. It's most concerned with how we treat each other. The Bible has, well, there are, I think we identified five verses that are often used to talk about homosexuality. There are some 3,000 verses that talk about how we use our money. And sometimes we want to concentrate on these verses so that we can ignore the other. Because this homosexuality, while, um, while there are many things I can, I can imagine myself falling into that would be displeasing or considered sin, homosexuality is not one of those. So it can be very hard to empathize with. So, um, so I know throughout the course of, of Scripture has spoken to it but not not loudly um, and not and not overwhelmingly with the same number of scriptures about justice love care for others um, that those kind of things so that that's part of what's in my head again I talked a little about tradition has buried throughout years that tradition is a little malleable um, then you get to the issues of reason okay is this something people are born with that we are always informed with reason. Um, for instance, uh, if you can remember this, anybody remember a guy named Galileo? Galileo uh, said, you know, I've been looking at things and I can prove that the earth goes around the sun. Not that the sun, the sun doesn't go around the earth. So the church fathers in their wisdom said, you're wrong, recant, we're going to throw you in prison until you recant. Well, I don't think there are many Christians out there today that would argue that Galileo was right. right? So we have to be careful. Reason always reinforms us the more because it's God's ongoing revelation. Creation is uh, the first incarnation of God. So we're constantly learning more about God, I believe, when we discover more about nature and natural processes. So that has informed how we understand uh, the larger world we live in. So... And I know there's a lot of debate. Is this, is it, how do you understand? Are you born this way? Is this a conscious choice? And again, people have lots of varying opinions. So, but those still need to be looked at and understood. I do know that when people who are oriented this way are not loved and embraced and cared for, that the mental health issues are real and severe and that the suicide rate among the homosexual population or the LBGTQ population is much, much higher than the rest of the population. Those are some facts. So, um, so reason all that wrapped up in together brings me to the next thing at the top. This is a way that has been expressed to understand where people are in this debate, in this ongoing conversation. Um, you, know, you can find this in any number of places. You can find Adam Hamilton going through this on uh, the website for the Church of the Resurrection. And you can find other places where this conversation has been had. So this, I found this to be helpful for me. So you often have people falling. And again, it's, it's always dangerous when you say people fall into one camp or another. Because we're all people. And we all have a variety of thoughts and understandings. And it, it tends to be dangerous when we lump people into groups and say, oh, well, you're a conservative, or you're, you're a liberal, or you're a progressive, or you're a traditionalist. Those can be very unhealthy. However, those are often the only way we have to talk to each other about many of these things. So you'll see traditional non-compatibilist. It comes from the word compatible. Uh, traditional compatibilist. Progressive compatibilist and progressive non-compatibilist. And so where people tend to land on this 
And this isn't just within the United Methodist Church. This is where people tend to land across the spectrum in Christian thought. Would be the tr traditional non-compatibilist would say um, the Bible's clear on this. Uh, there's no debate here. There's no need to continue the conversation. Um, homosexual persons are... Um, I, Homosexual marriage in particular, homosexual ordination should never be even be considered. And I will not be a part of a denomination that would even consider that, where it's even an option. Um, so th those people tend to, so that's on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you have progressive non-compatibilists. And there are people in this camp who say, uh, God loves everybody, we're all created in the image of God, and if you deny marriage and ordination to homosexual persons, uh, then you are, you, are, you are heaping an injustice. You're a sinner, right? So well, kind of on, the, on each end of the spectrum there, we have each other calling each other sinners. You're a sinner, and I will not be part of a denomination that will not allow for full inclusion for all people. So there are people in that camp. Uh, then you've got traditional compatibilists who say, look, I, I've read the Bible. I hear what the Bible says. I understand the tradition of the church. And where I come, to, and, and the traditional compatibilists would say, I personally don't think that same-sex unions and that ordination of LGBTQ people is what God wants. That's where I land. And however, I, I'm okay with being in community with those who believe differently from me. And I'm okay being a part of the denomination that would allow for that. Um, but I'm, me personally, I'm not there. So progressive compatibilist would say, well, I've read the Bible and I've done my prayers and I believe that, that we should offer full inclusion to all people. However, I'm not mad at people who believe differently from me on this. I understand how people can be in a different place on this and hold to a traditional understanding of this. And I'm good with being in, in part of a church where people don't believe exactly like I do on this. And so if you ask me where I land, I tend to be more in the traditional compatibilist group. Um, that's, that has a lot to do with my upbringing, has a lot to do with my understanding of Scripture, it has a lot to do with my teachings of the church. Um, so that, that's part of why I've said, I'll, for me, the way things currently stand, I remain in the United Methodist Church. Because I, while I may not be at a place where I would ever conduct a same-sex union based on my own personal beliefs, it doesn't bother me that my friend down the road, who's a fellow United Methodist pastor, would. Repeat that. I said, while I personally wouldn't, um, would, would struggle to perform a same-sex union, it doesn't bother me that a, that a fellow United Methodist church pastor would be in a different place, if given the authority by the Book of Discipline. But won't you have? No, no, no. So what is going to happen, what, so right now the Book of Discipline has not changed in any way. And what we are being told is that this will be, a, if it does change, one, only General Conference can change the Book of Discipline. The Book of Discipline um, may allow for same-sex unions in the future. It may not. We don't know this yet. But what we're being told is that no person will be asked to do something that they are not, can't do in good conscience. And that it will be up to the individual pastor to determine if they ever perform anything other than a traditional marriage. And I believe that. Uh, it also will be a decision of the local church. If, and this is back to, if the Book of Discipline changes. We don't know. We won't know until it actually, till a year and a month from now, what happens with the United Methodist Church Book of Discipline. So, uh, and I think that's one of those misconceptions out there is that the United Methodist Church is going to institute 
same-sex unions and say, you have to do this. Now, the people on the progressive non compatibilist side would say, yeah, that's what we should do. But most United Methodists are somewhere in those two middle categories. And there is this thing called a um, local church profile that is part of the conversation that will allow, that gives the, basically it comes down to the decision of each individual church and each individual pastor about what to do on this matter because it is a matter of conscience. And, um, and that as it stands now, United Methodist ministers don't have to do every wedding you're asked to do. Uh, it's up to the minister to decide regardless. Uh, um, and a minister can say to a couple, I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing your wedding. To a heterosexual couple, I don't feel comfortable doing your wedding for these reasons. So it will not be forced. If it does come to it, it will not be forced on anyone. And that's also part of that dynamic and part of that larger conversation that sometimes can get misconstrued um, because the, uh, I don't want to be a part of a denomination that would tell me what I would have to do on this um, because it, it is not, it, there's a lot of gray in this area. And that's where I find most of the people that I am in relationship with other pastors are in this gray area between those two middle perspectives. There are a few over on one side or a few over on the other side, but most people are somewhere in that middle place trying to figure this out. Ultimately, um, it comes down to this, and this is a, a reading I would like to I like to leave with us. It's a couple of sections from Romans chapter 12. First, um, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. And then Paul goes on to, to write in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. But take thought for what is trouble, what is no, noble in the sight of all. And then I, this verse 18 is very important for me. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. And then over in 13, chap, uh, chapter 13, verse 8, Paul writes, Owe no one, owe no one anything expect, except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not adultery, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not cover covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Um, I'm also, you know, come try to come to this as humbly as I can. Um, I think it's, it's interesting, something that um, one of David's former pastors shared with me, uh, this idea, you know, I may not be right. There are parts of our faith and doctrine that, that, are, are not, that don't come into question at all for me. The resurrection, the birth of Christ, uh, the divinity of Jesus, those are, those are non-negotiable for me. When it comes to this issue, I've told you kind of where I am, how I got there. But also, in all humility, know that I may not be right. But I want to, if I fail, I want to fail with the idea of love and hope and compassion. And do it the best that I can. So, Roger's going to step in and thank you all for being here. Thank you for attending to this online and uh, very appreciative for your time.
Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for those that have faithfully come and been a part of this group and also to those that are sharing with us by viewing online. I've been asked by some to share my point of view. And I know from our discussions, we are not all on the same page. I do take what you say very seriously, and I want you to know that. I hope you will respect my sincerity also. I did not have to be a part of this study. I had a concern about what was being said and talked about in the church. And I wanted you to know and understand that I am here because I care about each of you. I care about our church and I care about the United Methodist Church as a denomination. This is our last session together and there is a lot to be said in order to wrap up all that has been shared by the group. I thank you for being here and also those viewing at home. I hope you feel you have been given time to share your thoughts and opinions. I am sure at other times and places we will continue our discussions. But for today, I'm going to ask that you not ask any questions or make any comments. For the sake of all listening, I ask you to simply listen for now. And I'll be happy to discuss with you either this session or at any other time any questions and concerns that you might have. I began this study sharing my personal story as a young Christian, my struggle with the faith, my personal faith, faith journey, sharing the many beliefs I had, especially those things that I had to unlearn from my parents and from my community and the churches that I attended and was a part of. Many things for which I have later in life repented of, and even now I continue at times to repent for some of the things that I've said and some of the things that I've done in the past. Today I can only speak from my heart. There is so much we've only touched on very briefly. How do you condense a lifetime of study, a lifetime of experience into just a few short weeks? It's very hard. It's very difficult. I've tried to show from Scripture how the thinking, how the understanding and the mindset, the faith stories of those great men and women of Scripture, how they struggled with the faith, how they struggled with community and with culture that they were a part of. How the Spirit of God continues to lead and shape and mold the minds and thinking and understanding of Christians down through the years and ages. We have discussed things that we had to unlearn as well as those things that we have learned as we've shared in this discussion. There are so many things we didn't have time to study that I've tried to encourage you to study by giving you additional scriptures to look at and to, to examine, to study on your own. Some of you took seriously and looked at those scriptures. Others did not. For instance, I gave you scripture concerning all those laws uh, concerning the death penalty, how we could put our, our children to death, how others would not be allowed in the temple for worship. There were so many things that we need to consider and look at concerning hospitality laws and Issues concerning dietary laws and those type of things. We also talked about how we need to consider asking ourselves, are those laws still valid? Are they even reasonable for today? And we, we entered into that discussion. You've been encouraged at times to use scripture to inform your understanding of other scripture. We didn't have time to look at what some of the prophets, for example, what they had to say. We looked at one of the prophets, but at least two of the other prophets all so I had something to say concerning Sodom. But perhaps even more important than what they had to say was what they didn't say when they talked about Sodom and the events at Sodom. As we have talked, it's clear by our discussions that when it comes to the Bible, there is not always agreement on what the scripture says or how it is to be interpreted. It's also evident that we have many questions still unanswered. And yet there is a large body of scripture which we do agree on that is more important than any differences that we might hold. And like Steve, I tend to focus on those things that we hold in common. 
those things that we find in Scripture, which, you know, we agree on, which we can give ourselves to. To me, it's not about being right or wrong in every aspect of my thinking. I have been wrong many times in the past. And I confess that, not only to you, but also to God. It's about understanding, as I have said on occasion, the baggage that I, that we bring to the table of discussion. Placing that baggage before God and listing for God's judgments on its worth to my personal faith journey and your personal faith journey. Over the years, I've had to relook, rethink my theology, my understanding concerning homosexuality. I was biased in the past. I was far too judgmental in the past, in my teaching, in my preaching, to my shame. And I say to my shame, I helped to create a climate of discrimination. To my shame, a climate where I joked and made fun of those I perceived that were somehow different. To my shame, I have pastored churches and failed to speak when those churches were not very welcoming. When they failed to welcome all people. Oh, we had signs on the outside that read, all are welcome, but on, that was on the outside. That was for show. But on the inside, in our hearts, we were very selective in who was truly welcome in our churches and in our lives. Over time, God showed me where I was wrong. And the Spirit gave me new understanding. But more than that, He gave me forgiveness. Where I'd erred, where I'd made mistakes, where I'd been wrong. It took years because I'm pretty stubborn. But thank God, he is continuing to work on me and work on my life. And God has never given up on me and my faith journey. Hear me when I say I am not trying to win you over to my point of view. That was never my intention. Your point of view is between you and God, and I respect that right. My hope is that you will in return respect my right to believe to have a different perspective than what you may share. I must be true to myself, true to where I feel God has led me. I also believe that every person must decide for themselves what they will give their lives to, how they will choose to live out their own personal faith. That must be an individual decision. And yes, we do share and we hold things in common and we do work together. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, every individual must decide how they will live out their faith. One of the things that I've come to understand over the years is that gay people can live together in a committed relationship. There was a time in my life when I did not hold that or did not believe that, but that's not what I believe now. Because that was not my experience in the past, but it is a part of my experience now. I've come to learn and know and understand that couples can, if given the chance, have productive, productive, normal lives. Individuals, and I say individuals, persons who can contribute to society, individuals who love God, individuals who love their families, individuals, persons who love this nation, and who desire freedom for all people. That is my experience. I can't deny it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I confess that is not the way that I was brought up. I was brought up entirely different. Today, for me, I choose unconditional love for all people, all individuals. I see every person as special. I see every person as unique. I see every person as God's gift to the world. I see every person being filled with possibility as well as potential. And it saddens me greatly when that potential, that possibility is not realized for a multitude of different reasons. You see, I personally believe in the scientific evidence that homosexuality is a genetic trait that is a predetermined at birth. I do not believe that sexual orientation is a choice. I believe that it is predetermined. I also have come to believe that our sexuality, each individual, and I'm talking about both homo as well as heterosexuality, I believe that it is a God-given gift that is to be respected. 
It's not something that you can change by simply willing it so or something you heal or something you somehow overcome by having the right kind of faith. Because I've seen too many people hurting and suffering and struggling with this issue. I personally have come to believe that each individual's sexuality is a permanent part of the mystery of creation. That the divergence of sexuality is found in every culture. I believe that every individual is called to exercise our gift of sexuality. And we're to do it with integrity. We're to do it with creativity. And we are to do it with responsibility. And sometimes that's not what happens. And that becomes a part of the issue. I do not believe that anything goes. Or that we have the right for any of us to act irresponsibly. Many people choose to do just that. To live irresponsibly. And that adds to the confusion and the disagreements in our society as at large. That adds to our confusion. Because we tend to link the actions of some and label people the whole group. Label the whole group. And that's not the case. The issue of sexuality is not new to the United Methodist Church. Discussions have been going on for a long, long time, for generations, even though I know it seems new to some people, especially those in our church that come from other faith traditions. The United Methodist Church has been in conversation for years and years, and no doubt, in my mind, the discussions will continue on into the future. Not only in the United Methodist Church, but these discussions will continue on in all denominations. And to the discussions will be added other discussions on, on the moral implications of things like abortion rights and genetic splicing and genetic engineering and cloning and artificial intelligence. Some of those things have been in the news in the last several weeks. And the church will need to settle and talk about the morality of each issue as it comes before society. Where we stand, what position we will hold. Faith is not static. It is not frozen in time. And a retreat into the past will not work because change happens. And I have seen, and I go back as I study church history, I've seen the church try to retreat into the past. Time and time again, and every time it did, there was a failure. There was loss in membership. And it broke my heart. As I learn and understand how people have died for the faith, how they have been persecuted for faith. You see, I believe the United Methodist Church handles change, handles our differences better than any other group I know of. And I take pride in being a United Methodist and being part of the United Methodist Church. My life experiences have been influenced, as I said, by my experiences in the church, in working with individuals, in counseling, in study, in discussions. For example, my working at three general, different general conferences at my own expense. My inter interaction with church leaders from the United States as well as other countries. My working on legislation, working with others to help form our discipline. And I've been involved in that, not just at general conference, but at other times. Working with people across the country in discussion, listening to testimony and interviews. My life has been shaped by all those experiences. And it breaks my heart as I have listened to so many negative comments over the years about our church leaders. Many who have served for years faithfully and endured tremendous criticism and hardship from fellow Christians. Leaders who have given their entire lives to service to the church. Christians who have a passion for justice for all. Christians who are trying as best they can to be true to themselves and to their faith and to the church. 
And yes, individuals and leaders who sometimes make mistakes. My friends, I have made plenty of mistakes in my life. But our mistakes do not define our entire lives. Nor do they personal opinion, nor do the personal opinions of others define who we are. Just because we choose to label each other, that does not define who we are as a person or who we are as a child of God. Because that right belongs only to God making those judgments about our lives and what we need in our lives. My friends, I have been guilty when it comes to labeling other people. I've been guilty of stigmatizing others, especially other Christians that I didn't always know. I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of judging people who held other views than from what my own. I have been guilty of this, and I have to ask myself now, why are labels, any kind of labels, why are they necessary? What do they achieve? What do they accomplish? I've watched in horror and in shame Christians holler and scream and almost come to blows because they were so passionate about their point of view on a multitude of issues, not just on homosexuality, but on multiple different issues. Those issues are not something new. They're not new to the United Methodist Church. We've talked about how the church had the, the study on, on the homosexual issue back in 1992 and reported the General Conference. We talked about all the discussions down through the history that the church has made. This issue is not new. It's something that has been ongoing I've watched this struggle in the church for more than 60 years. And I have to say, shame on me. Because I've not always spoken up. Or spoken out. It blows my mind. Why can't we learn from the past? Why do we have to keep making the same mistakes in the church over and over and over? Why can't we live? And serve together. Why can't we find a way forward? Why can't we respect our differences? It's obvious from our conferencing and from our gatherings. It's obvious from our town hall meetings at different churches. As well as the town hall meetings and the discussions in this class and in this church and in our Sunday schools. We do not see or understand sexuality in the same way. But should that divide or separate us? Are we to ignore all those passages of Scripture that call us to reconciliation? Those passages that call us to service. Those passages that call us to ministry. Those passages that call us to mission. Those passages that call us to live in grace. And to work in grace. My heart has been broken many times by pastoral experiences I've had with families down through the years. Stories that would break anyone's heart. Families who felt stigmatized by church and by society because they had a family member that was gay or a special needs person in their family or someone that was overweight or someone that was autistic, someone that was somehow perceived by the church as being different. Sometimes even children that were unruly. But they were different. Family members, persons, not objects, not guinea pigs that we somehow need to study, but persons, individuals who struggle to fit in, to be accepted in church and by society. Individuals who for a long, too long, found no hope or understanding from the church. Individuals struggling with the church, struggling to make sense out of life, asking the same questions we all ask. Who am I? What am I here for? Will my life make any difference? Asking, when I die, will anyone miss me? Will anyone care? Just for a moment, try to walk in the shoes of someone else. Think about 
any number of people that you encounter in life, people who are simply hurting, and ask yourselves, why can't we speak to each other without all the labels we use? Why can't we speak to each other out of respect? Why can't we speak from God-given hearts of understanding and acceptance? Why can't I love unconditionally as Jesus commanded? You see, every day I struggle with this. I must remind myself, I must ask myself, what is keeping me from being the body of Christ today? What keeps me from being the person Jesus wants me to be? What is keeping me from living the faith that I claim? Every day is a struggle for me. I personally don't know any perfect people. But I do know that all are God's creation. There is much in life that makes me sad and feeling separated. Pastors are some of the loneliest people in the world. You may not know that. But pastors are some of the loneliest people in the world. We serve in the midst of congregations and there's a loneliness that can only be experienced if you're a pastor. Because we care about people. Because we choose to love unconditionally. And that's not always true for everybody else. Sometimes we do things that others don't approve of. Sometimes we have associations that others don't approve of. You see, I am deeply saddened by those souls forced by society in the closet's despair. I am saddened further that so many in the church choose to live in our own personal closets of despair. We choose to not talk about our fears, our dreams, our hopes, our hurts. We keep silent those things that we don't want others to know. Feelings and thoughts we dare not share. Sometimes family problems we keep silent about because someone in our family is abused or we ourselves have been abused. And so we keep it hidden. We can't talk about it. We can't share with each other. How I, how I long, how I pray for the church that could be, for the kingdom of God that is possible. A church where we can talk freely about anything to anyone and not be judged. How many years have I dreamed and prayed for such a church? And I thank God that God always has the last word. I thank God that I can trust God with the future of the church. Even in my sadness, even my, in my despair, in God there is always hope. With all my heart I believe you have a right to what you believe. And I will always defend that right and stand up for that right. Now this may surprise you what I say next. Some of you probably not. It's obvious that Steve and I don't always agree. We don't always share the same view. And that is perfectly okay. That's good. What a boring world this world would be if we were just the same. I don't necessarily share the same view that you share. In spite of our differences, Steve and I, we respect and we work together. We're in covenant together. And that word covenant is extremely important to ministers. We're in covenant in the, with the church also. We're in covenant or should be in covenant in all of our relationships, in our marriages. In spite of our differences, we respect and work together. I hope that the church, you, each of you, each of us would have mutual respect and covenant together, walk in grace together, work together and share our struggles and our joys as we share and live out our faith under the leadership of God's spirit. I would hope and pray that as Christians, we might understand that there is a sin that sometimes we forget, the sin of omission. With the best of intentions, we somehow believe it is best to not speak up to just not say anything, to just keep silent, to let others make the decisions on matters of faith, especially anything that smacks of controversy. Some people just bow out. Some people want to ignore it, want to turn away from it. I hope you hear me when I say everyone's faith, everyone's understanding, everyone's questions, everyone's concerns, everyone's opinions are important to God and to the life of the church. And they're important, very important to me. How important are you? 
You are the only Christian some people will ever know. Your mission is to share Jesus with them. There are people on this planet whom only you will be able to serve and help. If just one person will be in heaven because of you, your life will have made a difference for eternity. Think about that. Just one person. You can make a difference in the life of that person for eternity. There is no faith story, no other faith story just like yours. So only you can share it. There isn't enough time to learn everything in life by trial and error. We need to learn from the life lessons of one another, and we can. As we share, as we discuss, as we talk, we can learn from each other. I believe the eternal salvation of a single soul is more important than any else, anything else you and I will ever achieve in life. Who do you think our brothers and our sisters, our friends, our co-workers, our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, unbelievers will give more credibility to? I can't possibly as a minister encounter and meet every person that you know. It's impossible. But they will give credibility to you. To you. Someone who is a friend. Sometimes you are, I, I act as a parent, sometimes as a grandparent, sometimes you're simply a relative, sometimes a neighbor, sometimes a co-worker, but first and foremost, someone that they trust. And they can learn about Jesus and the difference that Jesus makes in your life and in your living, only from you. You will be that voice that God's Spirit chooses to use. We have to ask ourselves, who will they more likely share their deepest thoughts with? You see, it's not a matter of being right about every matter of faith. It's about, about loving enough to care. To care for other people. To care for others. And for me, that includes everyone. All of us. I don't choose to label anyone. I'd like to do away with all the labels and just see and understand and perceive people as individuals, as persons. Individuals who need Jesus in their hearts and in their lives. There's a word, and I know we're going a little bit over, but there's a word up here, centralist. And it's important to our discussion. It's the idea of a compromise between different expressions different attitudes, different views in the United Methodist Church. It's the belief that we can coexist as a particular denomination. It's the idea and the belief that together we can dedicate ourselves to helping all other people grow in the faith. It's the idea that we share an understanding that the ministry, the mission, the witness of the church is more important than any differences in our opinions. That's where I find myself. That's the position that I take. If I were to say it in a more simpler form, I would express it like this. And this is an old saying, but it contains so much truth. They came for the blacks, and I said nothing because I was not black. They came for the Jews, and I said nothing because I was not Jewish. They came for the Catholics, and I said nothing because I was not Catholic. They came for me, and there was no one left to say anything. My friends, I do not want to be guilty for not speaking up on behalf of all people no matter what their orientation. I believe it is a God-given gift. And I believe that God has called me to speak out and to speak up. Thank you for being here, for sharing. Thank you for your attentiveness. And if there's any questions, after we stop the video, we'll, we will uh, entertain those. Let us close in prayer, please. Most gracious God, we're thankful always for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful that we're people of hope. And Lord, there are so many ways, many ways that you encourage us in the faith. 
Lord, so much in his scripture that we do agree on. So much, Lord, that you call us to be in mission to and to be involved in ministry. So much that we are to give our witness to. Lord, may we hear your call upon our lives. And may we say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I, Lord. Use me. Here am I, Lord. Work through me. Minister through me. Heal through me. Touch the lives of others through me. Lord, we dedicate ourselves anew and as a church, not only to your care and to your keeping, but we dedicate ourselves anew to those things that you would lead us into and you to your future. In the name of Jesus, amen.